This podcast contains adult language, descriptions of violence, sexual references, and other possibly offensive themes. Listener discretion is advised. Previously, on Back to the Story. When you see God's rust surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are upon the pinnacle flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the forest enter it. For these are the days of vengeance, to fulfill all that is written. We are in God's rest. I'm sure we can find enough holy water <laughs> yeah. to have, yeah. <laughs> have <Absolutely>. that. <laughs> uh, you guys ready to jump back in? Mm -hmm. uh, I think so. Oh, I okay. need to roll my portents. Um, so you guys awake the next day in your various locations, eventually coming together in the early morning. And what would you guys like to do? When we all come down for breakfast, Ellery has a new haircut. I just want to say that. Those of you who have known her for a long time know that when she was a kid, she used to keep it short. And then once she get, got into her late teens, she would grow it long enough to keep it tied back, but then cut it off again every summer. So when she came out of prison, it was the longest it had ever been. and. She has kept growing it the whole time that we've been in Nymanet. So this morning, when she comes down, she still has the length, but she has shaved one side of it. So that is her new look. Good morning, Ellery. Morning. Uh, I'm assuming Ezekiel's going to meet us here. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, oh, sorry. Good. Right behind you. Ah. Don't Morning, know Ezekiel. You me. I'm not sneaky. <laughs> uh, and he'll just, like, run his fingers on Ellery's, like, smooth head. Looks good. Thanks. Figured it was time for a change. So, did we all get the answers we were looking for yesterday? Yeah. About that. And I will relay what the Vivis tree told me about Damadius and the uh, prophecy re spoken to me and in its extended form. Well, that's uh, certainly a lot more than I got. And I look down at my hand, which is still a little bit singed from the night before. I didn't pray, but I did talk to the redeemed there. She knows what we're doing, and so if something goes wrong, we can contact her. But she explained about the divine gates, and I'll go into everything I learned. And the really good points about how it will also let the evil gods influence the world and everything. That certainly keeps things in perspective. So it sounds like if we're going to this meeting, we're going into it already knowing what side we're choosing. Pretty much. But it might help to know what their side is. Find weaknesses or find people we can convince to come to our side. So how do we play this then? Do we pretend that we're not convinced yet one way or the other? See how much we can get them talking? Or do we go in trying to convince them to try another way, right from the start? I'd imagine we get the most progress out of the first attempt, or the first approach. I'll follow your lead. I'm not the best at biting my tongue, but I will try. So we're going under the guise of a diplomatic mission in order to find as much information about their cause as we can, basically. I would like to know why they're so insistent that this is the only way. Why they haven't just tried to restart 
on this side or fix their world. They don't seem to be interested in that. They seem to just want this. Right. It seems all or nothing. And maybe again, if we act like we're potentially considering their side, we can ask those questions. That's maybe what we should lead with. Mm -hmm. We're not convinced because we don't understand why they haven't tried that option. Sounds like a good place to start as any. Well, shall we send the signal? Melly, would you like to do the honors? Sure. And she does a thing, whispers, casts a spell. She kind of nods, receiving something in return. Um, we should find maybe in the room we can do it. All right, let's go. You guys move up back into the room. So we can either meet him back down in the teleportation circle we saw before, and he can come to us and then take us there, or he can send me some wounds, but it's one in a, the middle of the city. Uh, it's a bit dangerous, so one would be safer than the other. One will take longer, so I don't know. The safer option would mean taking that fucking elevator again? No. No. Mm. No. Well, I can get us there pretty quick, but then I'll have to, you know, rest up. Well, well I guess he could get us there. We could do that. If things go I, poorly... I won't be able to get us out if I quickly get us to the uh, the ruins. That's, we were that's what I was going to ask. I'd rather have an escape option. I mean, I could get us down there and then we could rest up a bit. I could clear my mind, maybe, and and go the next day after. It is 10 a.m. I am not sleeping. Yeah. I'm not sure if he'll wait on us, either, once we get down there. He'll probably just show up and then we go with him or I don't. Do we all think that we can survive the night? I mean, not going at all? or No, I mean, if we go there and we teleport down there quickly and we do not have an escape route, do you think that we'll be able to survive the night? I still have that scroll of, I think, yes, I still have that scroll of that uh, tiny hut. It could keep it safe. I mean, we could try... It's hard to get divine magic down there, remember? I don't think my magic is divine. No, but most of us do uh, draw well, on that. Yes, true. Why don't so, we think about it? I've I've got two things to do in the city before we go anywhere. Oh, uh, where is this other place that we could meet him? Um, he said it's in the center of the city. It's not a secret circle, so it's heavily guarded and a little dangerous. He said he doesn't have as much authority there, so be to the whims of the will and whoever's there guarding it. I mean, we'll be fine, right? It's just one night. And I can get us out if we need to. And he would meet us there at the circle at least. Maybe prepare them for us coming? That? Yeah, that would be the other option. Um, he said that one he doesn't have as much control over, or he could come get us at the circle we both know, down in the ruins. Is it safe to to trust him so much? I mean, he may be trustworthy, but we don't know if he can convince everyone else to uphold his end of the bargain. Maybe giving less time would be better? Well, um, it doesn't solve a, a problem of having to be there for at least a day, but if... We do meet him at the circle down there, and then he can take us to a more private circle. At least gets us there, but not in the center of town. Even if we have to survive for a night. That's the one he recommended. I don't know if we trust him or not, but... Yeah, we've survived a lot of shit, so... If it's overall safer... Do you want me to tell him? Um... Yeah, I don't want to take what we have left of Eliza down there, though. 
Yeah, why don't we run our errands? Really hoping to yeah, yeah get that taken care of first. Okay. Um, okay why don't we wait you. a bit and then tell him when we're ready to go? Okay. So you guys just want to run your last kind of poll errands and then meet back to follow through. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you mentioned you wanted to drop the ectoplasm off. Um, yeah. I'd like to go to the Temple of the Raven Queen for that. Sure. So that's kind of outside of the city. There's a large graveyard. Pretty easy enough. You're able to go there. They take it and in these kind of dark road, they put it into an urn and they seal the urn itself. Easy enough to take care of. There's a little donation tray if you want to put something in there, but they don't require it. They take care of it regardless. Sure, I'll give them some gold and then... Okay. To drop uh, a few gold in the plate. And then I will go to the Temple of Akashan and give them the scale and the holy symbol that we found and explain that we found the paladin, I'm guessing, down there. And sure. I couldn't give him a proper burial, but I didn't want him to be forgotten in the dark. So. Okay. You hand it to them at the precipice, and they let you know that they'll inform the the Dragon Knights, the Arbiters, and they take the symbol on scale. Okay. That's all I had. Okay. If there's anything else, otherwise you guys meet back up a few hours later, back in the room. Well, shall we go? Um, all right. So Melly. Um, I let, I'll let him know. She casts Sending Let's Brawl Know on the other side. And she pulls out some chalk. You can see it sparkles with the gems kind of embedded in it, crushed into gem dust that she got over the year that y'all spent in nine minutes. She's been working on the spell for a little while, hasn't quite figured it out until recently. Um, well, this is the first time I've tried this, so... Hang on. And Don't she kill us all. Takes a minute. Um, and Ball, she gets Ball and uh, some of you to like push the furniture towards the edge of the room to get room, turning the bed on the side and turning the table and pushing it ar- away to make a circle. And she takes the chalk, writes the inscriptions, the rune. Um, the runes themselves look dwarvish. They look like they match the runes in the Umbalk ruins below. Um, about 10 minutes later, she finishes the chalk, puts it away, and begins to cast the spell, putting her hands together as each of the runes ignite, using her wand to do so. As all of the runes ignite and glow, uh, a complex pattern of glowing lines connect each other and form a mesh beneath your feet. There's a flash of light as the ground beneath seems to break, as that light forms cracks, and the Ground below you seems to fall away. You fall through blinding light, and a moment later, land on the stone of the teleportation circle below. Looking around, you see the desk that was left where you found the Arcanatech schematic. The torches are out, but you're able to, Mel's able to cast light, and you're able to, to see yourself there below once more. I think I'm a little bit dizzy. That was so much cooler than mine. I don't feel well. Vesper is setting herself on whoever's closest. Um, um I, sorry, I was no just going to say, let her know, let him know that we're here, that we're here. Uh, Melly nods and does so, and after a few minutes, about twenty, twenty-five minutes, the runes on the circle begin to glow. As you kind of back off, moving away from it. And a moment later, whoosh, um, Officer Braun appears. There are a few, there's two other dwarves kind of standing behind him as well. As he looks up at you. Oh, hello. I'm so soon. Um, are you ready to visit? I think as ready as we'll ever be. All right, so it will be up front about this. And uh, let you make your decision here. When we get there, we will be in a embassy of the Deep Lords and the Architects. Before you are allowed to leave the room, the teleportation room, they would prefer strongly that you be unarmed. I can 
ensure you that it will be kept uh, safe, but um, it is a requirement of traveling into such a secure location. You can leave them here if you prefer, or we can leave them in uh, a box in the embassy. I can assure you, even if um, your decision is different, I will let us go our separate ways unless you initiate some sort of um, heightened conflict. Well, we aren't planning any violence as long as we can have your guarantee of safety on your side. I can give you my word of guaranteed safety within the embassy and its initial grounds. I can assure you um, that I can try to assure safety within the city of Set is a bit more of a difficult um d- a bit more of a challenge as um, the deep lords and architects are not the only uh, powers that be and I have not authority over the will but as long as you're with me I should be able to get us through most places I look around with- at the others is this agreeable? I start uh, pulling out the, uh, I think I have three daggers that I keep in various places and set them on the table, the desk. So you can leave them here or, uh, as I said, we can keep it in a box in the embassy. It is your choice. I would also recommend that uh, symbols of deities be removed. Um, the deep words of the Umbok and architects are fairly pragmatic, but uh, others may not be so welcoming to seeing such symbols. Do we have to leave them behind, or could we hide them? Like, we could leave them in the box in the embassy. Mm. I'm afraid not. Would you... No. I would tuck it under your shirt, at least. I will get lean down very close to him, out and widen my eyes. There are symbols about me that cannot be removed. I see. We'll understand that I will try my best to ensure other affections that this is a diplomatic meeting, but I have not, I cannot guarantee control or safety from other parties beyond the Ombak and Architects. If that is your choice, I will not stop you, but I want to be upfront about the risk. You take. Ezekiel, is there anything that we can cover? (sighs) It's fine. I'll put it under my armor. I'm not happy about having to leave my staff, but I will look to the dwarf. You've seen what I can do, and you know I don't need any weapons to do it. I have seen. Um. You have my word that I will do what I can. If you're leaving your stuff here, leave it and hold it. If you're leaving at the embassy, you'll be checked again. Their protocol once we arrive, and just to ensure complaints. I um, will turn my locket around, so I'll take it off, turn it around so that the symbol, the, the side with the symbol engraved on it is against my chest when I put it back on, and I'll also tuck it under my shirt just to be sure. I'll tuck the um, holy symbol under my shirt and take off my rapier and the dagger on my belt. Yeah, fuck it. I'll pull the three out of my left boot, the four out of my right boot, the three out of my left sleeve, and the three out of my right sleeve. The other other two on block kind of like raise their eyes if you begin this show. Um, Eventually, you guys take off whatever you're going to take off and you leave Um, it here in this room. I... I look at Vesper's hand. Is she wearing the ring? Yes. Yes, I am. I don't think you can tuck that under your shirt. Mm -mm. I will reluctantly take that off and set it on the desk. Oh, hang on. And I'll reach under my shirt, pull out the last two daggers, and set them down. Okay. You guys leave whatever you guys want to leave in this room as Braun is preparing the circle. Once he's towards the end, he leaves one rune unmarked. All right, if you're ready... Step on. As you guys step onto the circle, um, he prepares the last rune and begins to cast the final elements of the spell, the runes coming together and forming symbols below your feet. But as before, where you fell downward, 
you feel yourselves shifting sideways. You feel yourselves being squeezed under pressure. And a moment later, through instead of blinding light, you see darkness as you appear once more into a room. It has about 10 foot ceilings. It's about 15 by 15 feet. In the center is a teleportation circle, ruined in the stone, and where you stand is a pit of sand, this kind of dark black uh, beach sand. There's a door in front of you and a few slits all around the sides, these uh, murder holes essentially that open up as you see kind of eyes and movement beyond. All right. Well, if there's anything else you left all new, um, we will ensure compliance in the next room. One at a time. Understood? If there's anything else, you should uh, remove it now. Oh, I forgot my sling. I never use this thing. And I pull that out. The door is open, revealing a hallway. Again, with a few a few more uh, murder holes on the side. Um, and another door in the front. There is an umbach, heavily armored, in this marbled, this like white marble with dark veins um, armor. Um, who kind of steps up, there's a desk to the side, and he begins taking your stuff and patting you guys down. So I'll just do it in order here. Uh, he does Vesper. He searches you. Um, are you hiding anything, Vesper, or keeping anything on you? Um, I just have the holy symbol tucked under my shirt. Okay. Uh, he looks at it, but otherwise ignores it. Gruffs or something makes a noise, but ignores it. Um, next is Amson. Are you hiding anything? Uh, let's see here. I had a rapier, a dagger, and my shade saber. And no, I don't have any other weapons. Okay. Did you leave that stuff in the or, material plane? And my hand crossbow. Or are you taking that now? Okay. He searches through you. And that includes uh, arcane focus or foci. He's looking through those as well. Technically, my focuses are my instruments, but okay. they're just instruments. So. He doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't bother with that. Uh, Ellery, are you hiding anything? Um, I hand him the sling that I forgot about, and I don't mention the bone shiv that I have in my arm. Okay. Um, anything else you're hiding? I don't think so. Uh, would he okay. notice the mirror at all? There are ruins on it. He kind of looks at it and gestures to Braun, who kind of comes over and looks at it. Um, if this appears to be a uh, focus, it would be preferred to keep um, in the embassy. As long as I'm getting this back. You have my assurance. Then I very reluctantly hand it over. Okay. He pats you down as well. Are you wearing that vest with lockpicks on it? Yes. Okay. Um, he pats you down. And he didn't roll very well. So he pats you down. You kind of flinch a little bit as he lands his hands directly on one of the lockpicks. You can feel it hitting your side. Uh, but he just continues down, not noticing anything else. Ball, Ezekiel, are you guys hiding anything? Just my holy symbol. Okay. No, they don't bother with that. I've got my holy symbol. I, at some point, I would have left, I would have detached my onyx gem of the War Mage mm -hmm. from the weapon and stored that in my herbalism kit. Okay. It just kind of made it look like he was part of the, you know, just some generic thing for that. Anyway, that's what I would have done with that. Okay. Uh, roll a, roll a, I guess a slide of hand check. As you're going to patch you down, briefly looks through your equipment. Can I make, it doesn't make it much better, but can I make a performance check for, like some kind of check where, is it sleight of hand if I'm, if I had done it beforehand? Um, I mean, you can, I'm open to if you wanted to use another skill, depending on how you wanted to do it, because there's not a, um, if you want to try to play it off and, you know, herbalism kids start looking through stuff, you want to play it off like, oh yeah, that's a, Mortar stone or whatever. Yeah, you can do a deception check. Okay, yeah, I'll do I, maybe something to that effect where I'm you just trying better. to make it blunt. Do I? Yeah. <laughs> Out of nowhere. Okay, so give me a deception check as he, <laughs> as he kind of looks through your pack and opens this up and like briefly looks in there. All right, deception check. Uh, 22? Yeah, he's like, all right, fine. 
Uh, so you smuggle that through. Um, they do take any weapons away. You can keep your armor and shields. They don't bother with that, but just any weapons in focus. Um, Ezekiel didn't. Uh, Melly uh, will give up her wand, uh, but will keep her book. Don't she have that scarf, too? Ooh, that's a good point. Uh, Braun will notice that, and she has to give up the scarf as well. I do want to ask a question, because um, I've got a couple of potions on me, mm -hmm. um, or a few potions. I don't know what they would do with that. Would they just take them from me? They don't, they're not, they don't bother about the potions. Okay. They're mainly looking for weapons and like spell casting focuses that you can keep your armor and other gear. But yeah, Melly gives up her focuses. Braun lets her keep the spell book as he understands he's a wizard himself, but not any means to cast them. And after you all put the stuff on the desk, they bring out a box, which is closer to the size of a crate, and they put it all in there. Another room ball kind of writes down your names, and if you give them to it or any whatever you tell them to assign the stuff to it um, as a ledger. And eventually you guys are led out of that next room and into the embassy itself. Braun leads you up a flight of stairs, down a hallway, and into an office. Um, he leads you in, having you guys close the doors behind you. You see there's a table. There's a few rolled up pieces of parchment. And there's a few other pieces of paper that have been turned upside down with paperweights on them. All right. So and he kind of sits down in his desk chair. You've come to see. I can show you the city. I can show you what um, people believe here. I can answer any further questions or bring you to others who might be able to answer better. What are your questions? What do you seek in this um, diplomatic conversation? I think our major question, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's clearly possible for you to be able to get to our world and you can see what life there is like. If that's not what you want, then what is it? We would like that very much. And you're correct, we can go over there, but there are limits. We are watched by those who have banned us from that world. And though we can sneak across sometimes, if we attempt, and we have before, you need the greater numbers enough to actually live there, servants of deities come to reinforce the decisions of the past. And so you're taken back here? At the best. Depends on uh, who is found and whether they attempt to fight back. But the uh, Celestials will enforce what, um, the laws that they have chosen. Sometimes it is uh, just taking back. I have to say that um, if we visit the city and others and speak to there, know that um, the Umbok, I and others, and the architects are pragmatic, but you will find in the Will and the Helen the descendants that for generations they have been taught things. The promise of a return and are have a different perspective from you. They have been raised in it for generations, families, school, temple, in what happened. The view is different and convincing or views you may hold as evident in your world are her heretical here. But we can speak, if you wish, to some of them. I'm a little curious, before we move on to other topics, about the enforcement of this law. When Celestials come, do you know which particular god or gods they serve? Is it one in particular, or...? They am not the... Um, and not protect particularly well-versed in the religious uh, histories. However, they generally are the Storm Wardens, 
it um, guard the uh, tilt the transport between planes. And if too many of us um, arrive, the storm will enforce dictates previously decided. Right. I thought that might be the answer. Just kind of giving a bit of side eye towards Ellery. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> what other questions can I answer? Or would you like to see the city? Uh, will we attract attention in the city? It is likely, as he kind of looks towards Ball. Um, you are of a different appearance. I have some sway, and I should be able to keep um, most off of us, but um, I will be upfront that it will be um, it will be some risk. We'll try to mitigate it as best I can. Is there a way that we could be a little bit more undercover as we move through? Perhaps if you have a suggestion, we could try something. This one is going to be the biggest um, eye-catcher, so to speak, pointing towards Paul. No offense. That's okay, I'm used to it. We have, um, I can get us some cloaks that might um, make your colors less stand outish, but the big one will draw some attention. I could... Well, if I had my mirror, I could make it smaller, but only for about half an hour total. Tell me this. What is it that you want to know? Who is it you want to speak to? We may not have to go far. What is it you want to see? I think we just want to understand. Well, we live. We, and I know it may be difficult, perhaps talking to someone who knows the particular drives and aims of the Will and the Helen. Understand their aspects as, or opinions as well, and what their methods they plan to use. Yes, we can... Let us do this. We will go and speak. I can tell you of the Umbalk, and I can tell you some of the architects, though if you want to ask them specific questions, they would have to ask, answer themselves. Any operational details you understand would be withheld, but um, more cultural information we could divulge. As far as the will, we can speak to them. I know some officers there. And there is an embassy for the Helen, the Glean families as well, here. They are primarily stationed uh, in another city. But we can speak to their ambassadors here as well. He stands up from his desk. But I want to be clear, there will be some risk. I will um, mitigate it as best I can. When we walk through the city... Stay close to me. Don't speak. You are common, though I know it, and some others may, it is less common here. Your accents will give you away. Your symbols will as well hide them, unless you want conflict. I can persuade Will that this is a diplomatic mission, but I have no control of them should they want to turn it into something else. The city of Set is primarily held by the will, which means undead. Skeletons, ghouls, whites, vampires. Will this be a problem for you? I visibly grit my teeth. Ezekiel just grabs her hand. They are mostly controlled. Mostly. Mostly. I will not start anything. Good. Or if you do, I will not be capable of stopping it. He uh, speaks in another language, similar to Dwarvish, but not quite. And as the doors open, another Umbauk listens and then leaves a few minutes later, bringing back some large cloths. Dark, and they have a symbol, a runic symbol that you've seen around this embassy. Apparently a symbol of the Deep Lords or the Umbach. They're not cloaks, they're more of like blankets, um, but they can work to 
drape over your shoulders. All right. If you're ready, we will speak to a friend of mine. He walks you through the embassy. And as you walk by, you see murals and embossment in the stone of these umbaks, these dwarf-like entities seemingly carved out of stones, holding hammers or riding upon beasts, crafting various items, standing next to humans with glowing eyes, and there's a second half as if split in two. The other half where you start to see, instead of torches, you see glowing lights. Instead of hard umbak runes, you see arcane glyphs, uh, where you see a few, actually a pair of these people you've never seen before. They're short, maybe five feet tall, slender, bald, skin that's nearly gray, these large, dark eyes. One of them has a slender and well-oiled goatee. Bald as they kind of look up at you, stops for a moment, and continues. Thrawn leads you out of the embassy and into the darkness of Felnor, the shadow. Lightless, without sun, without moon, without sky, without stars. Above you see the scar, the wound across the sky, as if it was fractured and split open, broken, shattered gems across the sky. He turns and begins to lead you towards the city as the buildings start to come into view. Ruins at first, but as he begins to get closer, you see structures that are more intact. You see movement. It's dark here. There are some torches that give some light at the distance um, as you see movement. Stick to the right. As Grong leads you over to the right as movement moves towards you, you see an undead white with light gray, nearly translucent skin pulled taut across a skeletal form beneath, loose strands of hair, black, dreadlocked, leaning back in armor. Behind him is a block of skeletons, ten wide, twenty deep, that marches past you. I I do my best to get in between them and Ellery and kind of do whatever I can to block her view. You see the skeletons kind of sneer and turn towards you. A few of them kind of stutter. The white at the front kind of snarls back at the skeletons who drop back in line as they continue patrolling around the city as you move in. I grab Vesper's hand and make a point of not looking directly at the white or the skeletons. These skeletons uh, you see are not as generic as the ones you've seen before. These wear armor. Um, it isn't the best looking armor, but it, they're wearing armor, shields, weapons, and they have runes upon their head as well, the upside down tower, the symbol of the will. You move closer as the building buildings to appear more full of life or unlife. Torches glow. You see others, more whites. Every now and then you see a specter float through walls. And ahead, a large courtyard, a city square opens up as Ron kind of pulls you aside into an alleyway. All right. This is going to be um, the most difficult part of the journey. We have to cross the square. There will be more um, self-aware undead vampires who may um, stop us. If they do, keep your mouth shut. Understood? Understood. Could I... I have an ability to let myself understand the words of others. I don't understand what anyone's saying down here. Could I do that? Or would that be unwise? Hmm... They will let you make your own decision. There is chance if you are pulling power from beyond, from the deity, that it may be noticed. I know not the capabilities of the Mary. You may be okay, I'm not sure. It is beyond my realm of understanding. Does anyone think it'd be worth it, or should I just keep my head down? Let's try to avoid attention for now. 
Okay. All right. Stay close. And as he leads you out of this alleyway and into the courtyard, the lights ahead, you see there's a structure in the center, like a gazebo-sized small rotundra. There's no walls, just a few columns supporting it. In the center, there's a obelisk of dark stone, marbled. Surrounding it, as he leads you in a wide arc around the edge of this, you see there are four blocks of skeletons, all led by a single white surrounding this center, central structure. The blocks are ten skeletons by twenty, two hundred each, eight hundred in total surrounding this singular structure. That, as he moves towards to the other side, enter it, pulling you into another alley on the other side. That was the other option for entering. The circle there is known. It is less secret, but uh, as you can see, it is well protected. And that, he kind of points up. You see a tower on the edge, like a watchtower, built on the edge of this square, with a few torches at the top. You see a figure, shadowy, it's hard to make out the details, standing at the top. That is the will. Some of them. They watch who comes through. We should continue quickly. He continues to navigate you guys through alleyways. At this point, you're entering into the city proper. You see less ruins. You see more people moving about. And as you come out the other side of the alley and come into the roads, you see more thralls and vampires. There's still the occasional patrolling white and skeleton block, but these blocks are smaller. Maybe only about ten skeletons following a white. He leads you through, and you can see now in the distance the central tower rising up. Large. That is where our Demiri lives. In the tower. And this, as he leads you off to the side, is where my friend is. He leads you away from some of the buildings towards what looks like a stable. You can see skeletal horses tied up into it. A number of them. This is a large barn that stretches a hundred yards or so. You can see the skeletal cavalry moving in and out in blocks of seven, nine, occasionally a single or double pair moving about. This, they, um, it may be best if you will wait in an alleyway nearby as I bring her to us. It may be a problem to bring you all into the cavalry station. Can you stay quiet here? I believe we can. Good. He kind of looks around. He says, if anything comes, try not to resist. I will not be able to speak on your behalf if you harm anything. He nods and exits the alleyway walking towards the cavalry station and the stables. While he's gone, are you guys you guys are left in this alleyway, tucked to the side. You can see wind, a few windows, most of them are out, but a few windows around that have candlelight streaming from them. Are you guys going to do anything in particular? I think I just lean against the wall and try to breathe. How are you faring, Ellie? About as well as can be expected. You're doing quite well. This is a lot. This is a lot. Certainly different. Can we do anything for you, or is there anything we can do? Just stay close. And we wait. Looking around, are there any critters in the city that I notice? Uh, make a perception check. Okay. 21. Yeah. So through your way through, just looking around, there are the skeletons, whites. There are undead skeletal horses being ridden by vampires. There are spiders. There are bats that are flying around as well. You notice the silhouettes of a few flying that kind of stream past uh, the occasional torchlight of very large bats. You 
with that check, you've seen at least two that had a rider upon them as these bats that fly around. That's cool. And, and as you're continuing to look around, you notice something in the distance looking between the next alleyway over, a bit of light and movement on the horizon. It's hard to tell what it is. You'd have to shift over to get a better look. Can I do that without being super obvious or leaving the alley? Yeah, you just have to move through the next alleyway over. You do notice the alleyway he left you in, that most of the windows have no candlelight. It's kind of a more vacant place. You would have to go towards an alleyway where some of the buildings do have candlelight. Yeah, I'm going to go. Okay. Are you just walking? Or are you trying to be stealthy? Or? I mean, I, what is the point? I think okay. I'm just trying to be nonchalant. Not okay. necessarily sneaky, just like, I'm not doing anything weird. Super chill. Okay. As you move over to get a better look, the visage, um, you can see the rest of it. You will only be able to see a part of it from where you were. As you shift and kind of move through that next alleyway and kind of towards the road, but still in the alleyway, you can see this deep purple color swirling on the sky, almost like a forest fire in the distance. But it's not on the ground. It's in the sky and it's moving, swirling and is slowly getting bigger as you realize something is coming towards the city. It's hard to tell what at this point. It's very far off, but it is moving towards you. Um, well, I hope he gets back soon and can tell us if that is normal. Because I'll just point. As the rest of you guys see it as well. A few moments pass by. A few minutes. Time flows gruelingly slow as five minutes pass, ten minutes pass, as you're ducked to the side when the whites and skeleton blocks pass by, when a few skeletal cavalry pass by. But eventually, after twenty minutes, Roland returns into the alleyway, followed behind by a block of cavalry. Eight horses are led by one, Eight block kind of line up at the edge of the alleyway. Um, waiting outside as Braun leads this other skeletal horse into the alleyway towards you. You see this horse of bones with this greenish energy acting almost as muscles and tendons tying the creature together with the same kind of glowing yellow green eyes. Atop it, you see a lightly armored female with very pale skin. Red eyes, dark hair flowing back with a half cloak over one shoulder with a symbol of the will and another symbol as the buckle on her shoulder. She approaches. Um, well, this um, is my friend, Chevelle Sorana. She is a cavalry of the will. This is her crew behind us. She has agreed to answer some of your questions. He kind of gestures up Sorana as she kind of nose up almost as she looks down upon you moves the horse a few steps forward to face you well what questions do you have you can see she looks like she's in her maybe early 30s late 20s that's hard to tell but with vampires it's really hard to tell how old she actually is she's pretty though there are bags under her eyes and the Paleness of her skin is unsettling, unnatural. Now, don't all speak at once. Who does the will serve? Who leads you? The will? She kind of looks down at uh, Braun. Didn't tell them anything. The will is called such because it is the last will and testament of the ascendant Gleam Lord Demiri Voss. By joining the faction, you are signed into his will should he perish. He is also able to grant some abilities and natures should you earn them. Vampirism being the primary one, though there are many ways to serve the Miri and the will. The will, to answer your question, is an extension of Demiri himself. 
We are his nation. We are his people. And we are his army. He has led us well for generations since the fall. He has guided us. And he will guide us through these next difficult steps. And what is it that the will wills? Hmm. Freedom from this place, as she gestures around. We have grown accustomed to it over the generations of lightlessness, of absence from a divinity, but it is not the desire of the will. It is our and Demiri's desire to see the people set free, to be one with divinity once more, to gain access back into the light, through whatever means are deemed necessary. Uh, pardon possibly my ignorance, but could you define being one with the divinity once more? Divinity was taken from us by your gods, and we seek to release it from them. The amount we are due to return back to the mortals, to fulfill our souls. Many of us will not be around or be capable of accepting it when we accomplish our goals, but that is the sacrifice of the will. Why did you in particular choose to join? I was raised under the will, under the banners. It is a noble calling to join the will. I must explain, when you become vampiric, or you become a white, or a husk in the form of a skeleton, you give up your ability to take on divinity. Your soul is not able to do that anymore. It is a sacrifice that we make on behalf of the rest of the children of Felnor, the Umbach and the architects and the descendants of the God King himself. It is our calling to pay this price for our people and for all of the children of Felnor, that we might remove ourselves from the shadow. I will not benefit from the work I do, but our people might. And in your opinion, would the will ever accept a compromise? Perhaps light, maybe not divinity. Demiri has attempted negotiations before, far before my time, and those have failed and fallen through. The Umbok, then intentions are noble, and the architects continue to attempt diplomacy. It is the understanding of Demiri and his will that diplomacy is not an option. Perhaps it never was. If the gods would open and release the divinity we are owed, we would seek no retribution or conflict. But they will not. So the divinity is the most important. You talk about returning to the light, but it's the divinity you want. The divinity is the light. I see. Look around you. We have been this way for centuries. We have lived in the shadow for generations. Most of us have never seen the sun. That light you refer to. Only pictures. Lines on paper for most. I've never seen it myself. Would you like yeah. to? Very much so. I may be dead by the time it is brought back. But I would very much like to see it. I will die doing it, but if that is my last action, I shall accept that. The will is committed. Compromise is unlikely. We know what the cost is, and we have paid in our own souls and afterlife to see it through. The others are more open to it. And I will say, as a friend of Braun, 
It is unfortunate that it comes to this, but come to this it must be. We gather before you. We will not be stopped. If it is my advice you seek, I advise you step aside. Even if you wish not to join our ranks, do not get in our way. A world unites against you. A world depraved, derelict, desperate, willing to pay whatever cost to return what is owed to us. Do you know who he tried to speak with so long ago? Who the compromise was attempted between? I don't, not specifically. I would guess Timples, those primary factions who would seek to prevent us, but I know not any specific names. I, and as she opens her mouth to speak once more, she looks over to the side, and you can all see the light coming towards you. Oh, right. I meant to ask, what the fuck is that? A visitor. The last faction to fall in line. Your enemy, should you choose it. There's a smirk that comes across her face as she looks back towards the light, and as you follow her gaze towards it, you see the violet, purple, black light and fire in the sky. And as you see that movement bigger and closer, you see now wings stretching across the sky, massive. It takes you a moment to adjust to this enormity of this creature. You see as it approaches the outskirts of the city, it announces its presence. <sighs> Releasing a roar and breath of violent purple flames and energy into the air as it circles around before heading towards the tower. And as the dragon flies overhead, the beating of his wings shaking the windows and the stones beneath your feet, you look up to see the shadow dragon. And that's where we'll leave off and come back next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of Back to the Story. For notifications when an episode goes live, you can find us on Stitcher, Google Play, Player FM, or TuneIn. Download the app and subscribe or favorite us there. We also have a YouTube channel called Back to the Story, an actual play podcast. If you'd like to contact us, you can tweet us at back to underscore the story. If you can't fit it into 280 characters, you can email us at thebonfirefables at gmail.com. And if you'd like further information about the campaign, the player characters, or behind-the-scenes sneak peeks, follow us on either Twitter or our Tumblr website. Lastly, if you'd like to support the show, feel free to buy us a coffee at ko-fi.com slash back to the story.